Good afternoon, and welcome to today's NAJA Roundtable, the Local Legal Initiative, Legal Support for Indigenous Journalists. Our panel today features attorneys from the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, and they will discuss legal resources available to Indigenous journalists through the committee and its local legal initiative. This webinar is part of a series of roundtables hosted by the Native American Journalists Association that will discuss and examine the unique challenges confronting journalists who cover Indigenous communities. This webinar is being recorded and the re recorded video will be available on the NAJA website posted to the NAJA Facebook page and YouTube channel. This roundtable series would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors, the Ford Foundation, Knight Foundation, the Democracy Fund, the Google News Initiative, the Walton Family Foundation, the Tegna Foundation, and the Gannett Foundation. We thank all of them for their continued support. Our panel moderator is Sterling Cosper, NAJA Program Manager, President of the Oklahoma Chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists, and former manager of Muskogee Media. Sterling will take questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A option at the bottom of your Zoom window to submit a question. Audience questions will be posed to the panel as time allows. Sterling, the panel is yours. Oh, thank you, Brian. Well, I'll introduce our panelists joining us from Reporters Committee, um, Freedom of the Press. Um, first up is Rachel Johnson. She is a local and legal initiative staff attorney based in Colorado. She practiced complex litigation at Hollingsworth LLP in Washington, DC. In 2018, Rachel directed the federal communications team's review of documents sought through a Freedom of Information Act request at the Natural, Des Natural Resources Defense Council. Before that, she served as senior writer and creative communications advisor to the US Department of the Interior Secretary, Sally Jewell. She covered Capitol Hill for Roll Call in Washington, DC and was editor at Indian Country Today Media Network a video journalist for NY1 News in New York City, and a producer at the Stars Channel in Inglewood, Colorado. Next up, Kamisha Lowry is the Borealis Racial Equity and Journalism Fund Legal Fellow for the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. Her work focuses on identifying, supporting, and addressing the legal needs of journalists, reporters, documentary filmmakers, and newsrooms of color. Maylin Fidler is the Technology and Press Freedom Project Legal Fellow for RCFP, where she works on litigation, policy, and research on technological issues affecting key First Amendment rights. Maylin received her JD from Yale Law School, where she interned at the Knight First Amendment Institute and for a law firm litigating First Amendment issues on behalf of major internet platforms. She helped the San Francisco City Attorney's Office develop its cybersecurity and other impact litigation. Finally, Katie Beth Gardner is the local legal initiative staff attorney based in Oklahoma. In her role, Katie Beth provides local news organizations and journalists with the direct legal support they need to pursue enterprise and investigative stories in their communities. Additionally, Katie Beth provides training and other resources to reporters across the state in support of their work. So with that, Katie Beth, I'll pitch our first question to you. Can you give us a brief overview of RCFP and the local legal initiative? Absolutely. Thanks, Sterling. And thanks so much for everybody who is joining us today. We're thrilled to be talking with members of the Native American Journalist Association about what RCFP can really offer you. Um, so RCFP, we are the leading pro bono legal services organization in the country that serves journalists. And we provide journalists with a range of services from our free online resources aimed at helping Helping you know your rights um, and helping build up that support for your reporting um, to trainings to providing direct legal support if there's some type of record that you might need to get um, as part of your reporting. We're able to represent journalists, um, especially as part of the local legal initiative, which helps 
bring those resources at a concentrated level um, to five different jurisdictions across the United States. So like Sterling said, um, I'm the attorney in Oklahoma. I work here full time. Um, and Rachel on the call with us today is our attorney in Colorado. We also have three other um, attorneys, one in Pennsylvania, one in Tennessee, and one in Oregon. Um, and those attorneys are based full time in the state and they help bring the variety of resources that RCFP has traditionally provided um, on a large scale national network to the local level to support um, important stories and investigative and enterprise journalism. Excellent. That's a great broad overview of what you're looking to accomplish with LLI. Um, kind of getting more specific um, on tailored support and services. Uh, how, how about you tell us a little bit about services you offer for tribal media outlets that don't have free press protections? Um, what services are you able to offer? Yeah, so I think that there are a lot of really individual considerations um, that we can take into account when providing um, indigenous journalists and members of NAJA um, with support that they need to do their jobs. Um, so for journalists who might be working or covering um, uh, a specific tribal nation that might not have those traditional, what we think of as kind of freedom of the press um, protections. Um, one thing that we can do is help advocate for um, those protections to um, be realized by that uh, specific nation's government and their laws. Um, for you know those that might operate or cover tribes that do have those formal protections um, we're very happy to work within that system to help represent you um, and the rights that you might have and really tailor our approach to meet your individual needs um, maybe you're you cover you're with a tribal media outlet and you cover um, various topics that affect your community, um, but your right to, to hire maybe independent counsel is questioned. Um, we're happy to get creative with you, um, to think about those challenges, think about a way that we can help address them alongside you, um, to help ensure that you are able to realize those um, free press protections that you might have elsewhere. Um, we wanna be really responsive and where we're able, you know, tailor our support specifically to meet your needs. And I have to say, I give you a lot of respect because this is a big undertaking when we're talking about the number of tribal jurisdictions in the States and potential courts and all of that. It's quite an undertaking. Plus you're of course doing advocacy on the state side as well. So. Um, how about freedom of information issues, issues for tribes that do and don't have FOIA laws? Uh, Maylin, I understand you may have a little bit of input on that. Absolutely, so we um, have a resource in-house for all Oklahoma tribal nations um, that we've collected information on what FOIA um, protections are or are not available. So if you are having an issue with that, we are ready and prepared to help with that. Um, so feel free to reach out. Um, you can reach out to us directly. We also have a legal hotline um, that's available Monday, sorry, seven days a week, not Monday through Friday, um, during business hours, as well as a, an emergency after hours service. Um, so you can also reach out to us there. We also have a variety of legal guides. Um, so those won't be specifically tailored to Tribal Freedom of Information Act uh, laws, but they might be useful to other situations you're covering, such as protests or elections. And last to highlight, we do have a tribal um, uh, press freedom and tribal land guide, but that's mostly targeted at non-native journalists. So that might be something that you can refer others to, but uh, not necessarily for, for use within your own reporting. Um, just to circle back, how maybe hypothetically would you deal with a situation with a tribe that doesn't necessarily have a specific FOIA law, but you're trying to explore avenues of freedom of information? 
I'm happy to take that question um, just because, you know, that's a question that I've received on our hotline, like Maylin um, brought up. It's a, a great way for reporters to get in contact with us directly. Um, and I've certainly talked with journalists who have encountered this, that maybe um, the specific tribal nation that they're covering either does not have a freedom of information law or that law might only apply to citizens of that nation. And maybe, you know, they're a citizen of a completely different nation. Um, so in that case, we really have to get creative and work collaboratively collaboratively with the journalists. Um, we have lots of fabulous colleagues at RCFP who've been doing this work for a really long time. They're great creative thinkers. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of thinking about, is there you know, a source maybe that is uh, would be entitled to that information that we can reach out and establish a relationship with, or just kind of brainstorming those different ways that Maybe this information is recorded in documentation somewhere else. Maybe it's information that the federal government might have a record of, and we could support you in doing some type of federal freedom of information act request. Um, so we're happy to kind of get strategic and um, work to understand your specific situation and tailor our response to that rather than just sending you, you know, maybe a generic like, well, here's what XYZ is. And you're thinking like, this doesn't apply to me at all. Um, we're here to listen and do what we can to try and support you and your specific endeavors. That's something I like that I've heard a lot since this project started is you guys seem to be going into this with the spirit of collaboration with whatever journalist is reaching out for support. That you're not just going in and being like, we have to be the experts, but rather it sounds like you're willing to work with, you know, the people making the inquiries to find the best solutions, maybe incorporating some of their understanding of the tribe as well and, and making strategies. Absolutely. I think that collaborative um, approach and collaborative nature is so important um, because certainly we are not, you know, experts um, and certainly not experts in the, uh, the level that uh, many members of Nausea might be when it comes to reporting on their own communities. Um, and so we definitely recognize that we have a lot to learn um, from them and their experiences. Um, and that can really help inform our approach and how we can best serve uh, whatever their goals are. And on top of that, I understand there's also going to be a tribal law advisory board as well. Is that correct? Kind of helping support the project. So we do have a number of um, stakeholders who specifically are um, what I would consider experts in things like federal Indian law. Um, and even the intersection of that with typical kind of press freedom protections. Um, and that network is definitely something that we can um, rely on, refer to, um, but they certainly help kind of inform our approach and our work in this space. Excellent. So Maylin, I know we've kind of covered this a little bit, but do you want to give us a more in-depth overview of the resources available to Naja members? Yeah, I jumped ahead a little bit there. So our, our two primary sets of resources are available to any journalist. Um, that's the hotline. Um, again, you can contact us seven days a week. Um, we cover a variety of legal issues that come up for press members, as well as Freedom of Information Act uh, requests through that. Um, we also have our guides. Again, I think I mentioned a couple of these. Um, a few of them cover uh, covering protests, covering elections, um, a variety of different kinds of records requests. And then we do have that uh, press freedom and tribal uh, lands guide. Again, that's for um, primarily non-native journalists. Excellent, thank you. And uh, what other sports services outside of LLI does RCFP offer that would benefit our members? Hi, um, I can offer, um, well, I can take this question. Um, so the other services that our CFP can provide, and we love to provide this type of service, is webinar and trainings. So essentially, 
what Malin pointed to, such as the guides like pre-publication review guide or our uh, tribal law guide or election guide, essentially we can offer a training relating to those type of topics. Um, we um, also um, talk to organization representatives and we say like, hey, what, what kind of areas do your members really wanna know a lot more about? So if Nadja was really interested in FOIA work or maybe uh, safety tips while they're covering protests or anything of that nature, we're able to create a training um, based on whatever need that you are currently having. So that is, well, we're just willing to cater to whatever your need is. Um, but yeah, so our trainings can be anytime that you want it. It's just like whatever your interest is, we're willing to help. Um, you can talk to the either the LOI attorneys, you can talk to the fellows. Um, and that's pretty much it when it comes to trainings. Thank you, Kamisha. So the LLI project in Oklahoma is RCFP um, with the two grant holders, the Oklahoma Press Association, along with NAJA and other state stakeholders um, under these two groups. And similar in Colorado and other LLI jurisdictions. Do you see this project fostering collaboration slash unity between tribal and non-tribal media? Absolutely. I really hope that that is something um, that we are able to help facilitate, especially in Oklahoma right now. There is so much interest in reporting on, reporting within the various indigenous communities across the state. Um, and even in our work as RCFP and my work here um, as an attorney who does a lot of stateside um, freedom of information work as well, I'm always referring um, people who are not indigenous journalists or maybe unfamiliar with this topic or this is their first time covering stories um, about issues maybe like the McGirt case. I'm always referring them back to um, best practices and resources from nausea and other things like that. Um, and there are just really a lot of great um, journalists in Oklahoma who are nausea members, um, but they don't always cover indigenous stories. You know, nausea members cover all kinds of stories um, and are leaders in their coverage of all kinds of matters, whether it's, you know, criminal justice or education. Um, and we're really happy to help um, support them in that as well and elevate their work in that way as well um, so that they don't, uh, so that the other kind of more traditional media silos um, can help recognize the really great work that they're doing on uh, a lot of topics of interest. Excellent, thank you. And kind of on this note, you mentioned the recent uh, Muscovy Creek Nation Reservation SCOTUS case. Um, it's a big developing story in this area and probably going to play into a lot of your work with LLI. Involving the interest of the state, many tribes, especially Muscovy Creek Nation, my home tribe, um, that was directly tied to the case. So do you offer services like guidance regarding the legal aspects of coverage in cases such as this? I think I can jump in and answer uh, that question. So we are not uh, tribal law experts. We are First Amendment experts. So we are happy to offer commentary and analysis on any issue that touches those things. If you're looking for um, expertise on things like ICWA, we're not gonna be uh, very helpful there, but anything with uh, regards to press freedom, we are happy to help. Would you guys have uh, some possible referrals for services like that? Yes, I believe Katie Beth, the folks that Katie Beth mentioned, we would be able to um, refer you out to those. And yeah, and um, just picking up back on that question, Sterling, another uh, service that we do provide, it's in a little bit of a limited 
circumstance because traditionally we partner with other organizations to provide this service. But um, our CFP does provide pre-publication review, uh, which involves vetting a publication or vetting a long form piece that you might wanna publish uh, via the airwaves um, before it's um, published to assess legal risk and make sure that if you are putting a piece out there, um, you know, you're, you feel pretty confident legally about, um, you know, providing that, that piece out uh, without, you know, maybe potentially, um, being sued for defamation or invasion of privacy uh, issues that can come up when you're working on a piece. Um, and so our, our CFP does provide that assistance um, technically and, and usually with our partners who are the Fund for Investigative Journalism, um, International Documentary Association, and then the freelance investigative uh, reporters and editors. And we have a really fabulous staff attorney, uh, senior attorney who does a lot of that work. Her name is Sarah Matthews. Um, but every once in a while, you know, um, an LLI team member uh, like, you know, Katie and I, or even Kamisha, I think, has also worked on pre-pub uh, review. Um, we can be really helpful in assisting from that perspective. We might not be able to take the case just because of how we partner, but we certainly be able to help um, provide assistance and who to reach out to uh, should we not be able to assist with that. But that's a really great service. I think it's been um, helpful for Colorado journalists um, that I've worked with a couple of times. So that's a great service. I imagine just having that reassurance before publishing a big technical story means a lot. I've, I've been in that scenario. So this is like, they have the work done, they turn it over to you for review, but maybe not so much like hand in hand while they're going about compiling their coverage. No, it actually, Sterling, it can vary. I mean, usually we, we would like to have a finished product. I worked with a, a documentary filmmaker who had a pretty completed project, um, but there's always room for edits, right? There's never, it's never completely done until it's done. Um, and, you know, we're, we would be happy to take a second look if the reporter or filmmaker decided later on, you know, hey, I wanted to add this piece. Can you also take a look? But it's helpful to us, I think, just um, as lawyers reviewing work to have something pretty near complete, but it doesn't uh, prevent us from taking a look at that stuff as it rolls in. Excellent. Kamisha, were you about to say something there? I was. Um, I don't want to sound redundant to Rachel's point, but um, when when it comes to referrals, I think essentially RCFP prides herself on the fact that if we cannot help you directly, we can't. We have a big network of attorneys or organizations that are willing to help you with every need that we cannot assist you with. So, for instance. Like Malin said, we focus on First Amendment protections and um, news gathering rights. So if you're, if you're, if a member in your organization approaches us and say, like, "Hey, I'm having copyright issues or intellectual property issues," instead of us just saying, "Eh, we can't help you," like we actually will be like, "Hey, I know such and such in let's say Colorado that can deal with this issue there." ready to help you. So we're not going to leave you dry is essentially what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, that's nearly priceless support there. So that that is excellent. And Katie Beth, I understand that this is a two year grant, correct? But there are plans to try and continue to seek funding to keep this project perpetual. Is that correct? Yeah, so for the local legal initiative, um, we are beginning with this two-year initial commitment to each one of these individual jurisdictions like Oklahoma and Colorado, um, but we're actively gaining support right now from kind of those um, local jurisdictions and funders nationally to be able to sustain this project long-term. Um, and eventually the hope is to even expand it to more places. Excellent. Well, I'd like to ask, and you know, without getting too specific, Katie Beth, what are some of the uh, big tribal matters that you've handled so far with your uh, tenure on LLI, just in general sense? What are kind of the inquiries? Going to be? 
Yeah, so I think that a lot of the um, inquiries that I've seen so far mirror a lot of, um, in a lot of ways, what I'm seeing from journalists on the, the state side of my practice. So I'm seeing a lot of really great reporting and news gathering, um, journalists trying to get the information from the source, find records. Um, and in a lot of cases, we're working in, I haven't done a, a single matter in the same tribe yet. So I'm getting lots of different inquiries spread across Oklahoma about, you know, how can I get this, re this record related to financials from um, this story that I'm covering in this community. Um, and so it's been really exciting to be able to kind of learn more about each one of um, those different nations, you know, an essential component of tribal sovereignty. I don't have to tell this group is that they get to have their own governance, their own laws. Um, and so that's been exciting to get up to speed on all of those different um, kind of legal ecosystems and see what there is that how, how a lawyer can be helpful in those situations. But I'm definitely seeing a lot of um, inquiries kind of in the vein of public records requests and requests for information. Excellent. So we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but since LLI right now is in five states, do you see the possibility for cross collaboration between those five areas where the project is currently operating? Uh, Kamisha? Yeah, so um, I definitely feel like there can be cross collaboration for sure. Um, I think, again, I feel like it really depends on what your legal needs and challenges are, right? So, um, again, we can offer you webinars, we can offer you trainings. Um, and we have words, for instance, I think we're having a cross collaboration training or had, we had a cross collaboration training with the National Federation of Community Broadcasters and um, all, along with Public Media for All. So we're always looking for ways to collaborate. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much, we're, we're just always looking for ways to collaborate for sure. And so that, I can see that happening. So, Rachel, go ahead. Sorry, Sterling. And I, I also wanted to point out, because I know a couple of other folks, Malin and um, Katie Beth, and also Kamisha touched on our trainings. Um, and I meant to chime in a little bit earlier about our FOIA trainings. We have this excellent guru at RCFP, um, Gunita Singh, who, um, you know, uh, trained several journalists uh, in FOIA. And um, it's it's a really great opportunity for journalists to get uh, some additional information if they're in a position where they're seeking documents from a federal agency. Um, you know, if you're seeking documents from the Interior Department um, and you want information on the Bureau of Indian Education, or if you want documents on the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, or even you know any of the other agencies, Bone Bessie, um, that you may be reporting on, we could provide assistance and training as far as you know how to draft a really solid FOIA request that might pry some uh, records loose that you might. Um, you could probably definitely get on your own, but it might help to have a little bit more expertise um, from one of our attorneys to assist with that. Um, the other thing that we provide is under, in Colorado, there's the Colorado Open Records Act, which is our proper public record act um, in the state. And we can provide trainings um, to journalists um, on, on that uh, statute as well. And I also wanted to come back and add, um, that we also have a primer as well on press freedom in Indian County. So that's another way that we collaborate and um, other ways we can collaborate, obviously, again, advocacy efforts um, and panels like what we're doing now. Um, so there's tons of ways that we can collaborate. Excellent. Well, without starting an impromptu FOIA training, I think, Rachel, what you're pointing out is a lot of times 
the concept of FOIA is very simple until you get down to trying to make your request specific enough that you don't leave holes where they basically can say you didn't ask for that in, in a manner of speaking a lot of times. Is that correct? Can you kind of help journalists tie those loose ends up and try and find those holes? Sure. And, you know, I, um, I don't, my practice isn't too, isn't really focused too much on FOIA, even though I have had, you know, some experience with FOIA uh, requests, um, you know, and I, I would primarily kind of look at the case from a CORA, from a Colorado Open Records Act perspective. But, you know, just, um, I recently did a training or a little bit ago did a training with um, our FOIA expert and CORA expert. And we had a lot of questions, you know, just on, um, should I say and or when I'm drafting a request? Should I say and, you know, how will this information, how will the way I draft the request be able to provide information that maybe I wanted or I didn't want? Um, how do you narrow your request? You know, you can narrow it as far as the date, the period of time that you're requesting a record. You can narrow it um, by, you know, thinking of a very specific um, person who might be involved um, in the request in the area that you're working on um, or reporting on. Um, you know, uh, so there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunities for training um, to assist journalists who might need that assistance, and you know, just. So folks are aware of what the nine exemptions are, you know, um, to FOIA, that's probably really helpful to a community who's doing really great or, or you know, wanting to do a lot more work um, on, fo on FOIA and in FOIA and is currently doing that. And I think I would add quickly too, to kind of Rachel's point, um, you know, Rachel and I do a lot of work as well on kind of the, the state public record side. And I think that that can be kind of, um, we, we automatically tend to think like, oh, FOIA and the federal government will have lots of information that could be um, pertinent to the type of um, reporting that your members are doing. But I think as well, I, I'm seeing an increase, I think in Oklahoma, I mean, there's a lot of open hostility right now um, within the state government um, since kind of the, the McGirt ruling about how this is going to play out. And I think there's a lot of information out there to be gained about, you know, how can I use things like the state public records law to um, be able to get information about what the what the state governor's response is to this and their relationship with individual tribes. Um, I mean, that is certainly um, a huge issue that we're seeing played out right now um, and can certainly be something that we are happy to support um, reporters in and alongside. And oftentimes, say you couldn't get something from a tribal government, sometimes those same documents, depending on the nature of the subject, may be able to be found in state or federal FOIA requests too sometimes. Is that correct? Exactly. So this project launched and then COVID happened. You know, we were having these stakeholder meetings ahead of when we got off the ground, but uh, what do you think the outlook is for uh, us getting back together again? And how do you think our approach has been, you know, as stakeholders in this project, how do you think it's gone in handling COVID and doing so many things remotely? How has that experience been for you? You know, I think RCFP has been um, extremely proud that considering this past year we were able to get this project you know off the ground and officially launched in all of our five states and absolutely that would not have been possible without each of our individual stakeholder groups in the jurisdictions that we're working um, and certainly in Oklahoma nausea has been such an integral part to getting this initiative to the state in the first place so that it can really benefit all journalists and news organizations here um, and then really helping 
sustain um, and tailor our work to the, the population of journalists and news organizations in this state. So I'm very proud of the, the work that we've been able to do um, in a short amount of time, considering all of um, the challenges that we faced. Um, and I'm very hopeful that in, I mean, I know here in Oklahoma, we have vaccine is available to all. I'm really hoping that that helps us um, get things open here, get a little bit more back to normal step by step, um, and that we will continue to see progress in this um, initiative, but very proud that we have not been um, stopped or faced any kind of significant setbacks thus far. Excellent. I haven't seen any. Thank you guys are doing great. So just bringing it back to, you know, issues of open government and tribal free press. Um, you've been on for a while. You've spoken with people. Um, maybe you've had a chance to take a look at a few of the laws. Um, Katie, Beth, and anybody else, what, what is kind of your bird's eye view of the state of freedom of press and tribal media in Oklahoma, right? And I'll certainly let um, Maylin jump in on this if she would like to as well, because she's been doing um, an excellent job helping gather all of this um, research for us, find all of these different laws to help us kind of get uh, an idea about the um, state of press freedom, specifically in Indian country in Oklahoma. Um, and what I've been seeing is certainly, I think that there is a, um, trend um, of a lot of great advocates um, within many communities themselves working to um, push for greater transparency, um, push for things like press freedom. Um, I'm very happy to see that there are a number of nations who have really interesting freedom of information laws and things like that. Um, and I think those that exist, I'm excited to be able to support um, different journalists as we take some of the, the initial work and try and feel out the boundaries of um, those laws and actually put them to the test and, and see how they work to um, protect journalists within the community. Um, but I think Maylin might also have some um, notes to kind of offer on that since she's done a, an incredible job helping us gather all of that information to build our practice up in this area. Sure, thanks Katie Beth. Um, so we have been going through and looking at um, every publicly available source of information about um, freedom of information or other press protections in uh, tribal nations in Oklahoma. I can say sort of broadly a couple trends that I'm seeing. Um, one is either um, tribal nations have very detailed laws or not very detailed laws at all. There's, there's very little in the middle. Um, and so that's sort of something that we're seeing fall into one of those two buckets. Um, and if it's not very detailed, usually that just means there's a constitutional provision saying there's freedom of the press, but there's not a lot of um, elaboration on that point. Um, so this brings up sort of a meta issue that, you know, I as a lawyer would certainly like to work on. Um, it's just, it's very hard to access information um, remotely about tribal nation uh, free press laws. And so that would also be something sort of, I would love to, to push forward is um, just access to information about those laws in the first place. I would say that's pretty par for the course based on my experience. I know I'm just moderator here, but um, as I mentioned, I am former Muscogee media manager and we had quite a interesting situation with our tribal government where we were able to pass the free press bill 2015 and fortunately because it was not constitutional, it was able to be repealed through the same process of the legislature and the executive branch. And with the help of nausea, we were able to, to get it back in place, but you know, that just goes to show it it's a challenge. You, you make gains. Um, these protections are tested and you see what shakes out. But I think what really excites me about this project as someone having gone through this experience is it's great to have a resource like this. I, I would have loved to have had you guys back around a couple of years ago when I was dealing with everything. And I just really look forward to what you have to offer um, moving forward. 
to our tribal journalists and those covering the new country. But uh, we are getting pretty close to our Q&A section. I just want to remind the audience to use the Q&A feature at the bottom if you want to submit any questions. Um, if we don't, I might pitch it back to our CFP guests to give us a little bit more information about contact, further resources, et cetera. Sure. So I know that throughout kind of this presentation, um, we've been dropping several links in the chat. Um, definitely, I think the easiest way for people to get in touch with us is to utilize our hotline. Um, and you will be directed to an RCFP um, staff member. And specifically, if you you know, indicate that you're located in Oklahoma or Colorado or any of the other jurisdictions um, where we have the local legal initiative project, you'll be put in contact directly um, with that lawyer. So for example, if you contact the hotline and indicate that you are a journalist located in Oklahoma, you will be put in direct contact with me. Um, so if you can just remember to, you know, get to our CFP and the hotline, then you will be able to reach us. Um, and like Kamisha said, it is you know, a great resource that is available 24 seven, um, whatever you might need. Um, and I think it might be interesting if we have just a, a few moments to um, share kind of the, the routine type of questions or kind of examples of um, things that journalists have reached out to us about. And, um, you know, that might be kind of general examples or um, in particular, maybe journalists who cover um, indigenous topics. Um, I can share that, you know, I get a lot of questions on the hotline about um, state public records questions or like Freedom of Information Act questions. How is this type of record available to me through, you know, this mechanism? Um, and I'm able to kind of provide some type of an answer of, you know, maybe not that, but let's try this or think about it that way. Um, you know, I think it ranges from that all the way to, you know, we might get a journalist who says, I've just been served with a a subpoena and I'm being told that I have to come testify and maybe even a tribal court. Um, what, am, what should I do in this situation? How can you help? Um, we love to hear from uh, people and see what we can do to help them. And I think uh, my colleagues might have some interesting examples to share as well on that point. Right, and our hotline even gets more pressing issues, such as if you, uh, for a, a, a real life example, like if you were covering the Capitol riots and you were a journalist and you were arrested, um, you could have called the hotline or someone who worked with you could call the hotline and say like, hey, I was arrested or hey, my coworker was arrested. and we had an, um, attorneys on call um, ready to solve that issue. Um, so that's another example. Or another example would be like, if you are a journalist and you're trying to enter, a, let's say a, governor, a governor's press briefing and you're denied press credentials, where they're ready to assist you. Um, so hopefully you can gain access to the briefing going forward. So it's just really a wide variety of issues. I don't think any um, situation is the same. Um, there's always little nuances here and there. We, you know, we're, we're humans, like different things happen every day. Um, but those are some examples that I've seen recently. Excellent, thank you. Happy so, Rachel, oh, we do actually have a question down here from Sky. Dance, curious, uh, NABJ, NAHA, and AAJA have been vocal about the lack of their people on screen. So you see the result of it in this season shows. Do you know why nothing seems to be appearing when it comes to Native Americans on screen and in TV? Well, I don't know that this is quite an LLI question, but. 
Um, we definitely uh, do do some programming related to Native American uh, representation in mainstream media. But our focus of our discussion today is the local legal initiative. Um, Rachel, I, I was just curious, uh, since we have a little extra time here and in Colorado, how would you say the tribal media landscape differs or compares to that in Oklahoma? Sure. Um, you know, I, <clears throat> that's a really good question, Sterling. I think the, the tribal landscape in um, Colorado probably differs um, a little bit from Oklahoma in that, um, you know, I could say I would love to um, work with more uh, native journalists. Um, we do have the uh, Naja um, uh, Colorado uh, group here in Colorado. Um, and so that's, that's really awesome that we have that uh, outlet as well. Um, you know, I do have, and I have through the hotline, I guess I could say, had some um, questions come through um, that would certainly be of interest to uh, uh, native journalists or areas that they might cover. Um, just when I was with ICTMN, a lot of the work I did was uh, covering sports and um, in covering sports, we covered the Washington football team's name change deb debate. Um, and so, you know, some of those stories are being talked about nationally now, you know, you have the Braves considering changing their name, um, but locally in Colorado, um, and I can uh, kind of go back to, to what Katie's question was as well, maybe this will help answer your question as well, Sterling. Um, the hotline request that I got was related to a high school mascot um, and name change debate. And so there's a lot of stories, um, not just on a national level that are related to, spate, uh, to sports and um, mascot debates, but also on a local level. So I'm seeing some of those requests come in and um, would be more than happy to help journalists fight uh, public records laws to get access to, you know, hey, what did your high school say about this name change? What did the public high school say about this name change debate? And how can I report on that better um, being a journalist of color? Um, but, you know, I, uh, certainly I think that um, the landscape is a little bit different. Um, in Colorado, I know we have the Southern Ute tribe and um, the, uh, I believe it's the Northern Ute tribe. I'm, I don't think I'm getting that right, 100% um, correct. Um, but I would love to work with tribal groups uh, like that in future and just journalists who are covering um, native communities here as well. Excellent, thank you. I'm really happy we were able to get another LLI attorney on this call. It's really cool. I've just been curious about the other states. So we have a question from uh, Lori Edna. Uh, the issue I have in our tribal court, one has to pass the tribal bar exam to practice in tribal court. So how would you deal with such an issue if a native journalist needed to be represented? And I'm gonna go ahead and jump into this next one because I think this may be part of it. Previously, we had a gag order put on us. The tribal attorney refused to assist. So I had to go to court on my own, but fortunately the case was dismissed. Yeah, so I'm happy to take that question. Um, and I guess I would say, Lori, I'm, I'm really sorry that you had to you know, go about that um, by yourself. I can't imagine how stressful that would be. Um, but I would say that, especially in the, the jurisdictions, like for example, here in Oklahoma, um, you know, part of the, the reason that we, we came here is we're willing to make that investment uh, where we need to, to be able to um, practice and be admitted to different um, jurisdictions. Um, I was just recently this week admitted to uh, my first tribal nation court to be able to practice there. Um, so if there is a, a situation where we can work to be barred and have the license to practice um, within that system and it's a reasonable thing that we can do we certainly will make those efforts where we're able to 
Um, but if it is, is something that is not going to be feasible, then certainly we can work to try and refer you um, to maybe somebody who is already licensed to practice in that specific tribal court um, so that you, you are not having to go at it by yourself because that can certainly be um, for any court such a stressful situation. And that is definitely what we want to help avoid. I just want to piggyback on what Katie Beth was saying in Colorado um, for an attorney like me to practice in tribal court. Um, my understanding is that it would be a matter of filing application to practice and paying a fee. So if you needed assistance in Colorado, that could, that's a, you know, it, it sounds simple, but um, it might be a little bit more of a, of a process here in Colorado. But that's not a, a difficult lift from my perspective to be able to assist a reporter if you did, um, you know, want to get access or, or were um, finding yourself needing to go to tribal court um, if we needed to litigate in tribal court on your behalf. Yeah, excellent question, Lori. This definitely is some things that were on my radar when this project came up as challenges, you know, I've been privy to in the past, say, you've been told you can't have your own counsel, which we've kind of covered here. And maybe they assert that the attorney general is your representation where they may be representing the other side too. Or say, your newsroom leader may not be leading the charge on a free press issue, but you as a reporter want to explore your protection options. These were kind of things that came to mind. Um, as potential challenges and also based on my experience in tribal media. But uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, this is just excellent. And I very much look forward to moving forward what you all are able to offer um, our excellent tribal journalists in Oklahoma and the other areas you serve. Um, thank you for joining us again today. Um, are there any final comments, anything else you'd like to share with the audience before I kick it back to Brian? I think I would just say um, that if you want to learn more or find yourself in a situation where you need um, some extra support, please don't hesitate to reach out. We have a large staff. We're here to help. This is what we do every day. Um, and we really want to be able to be a resource to you to make your jobs easier, your lives easier. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and like we mentioned, the easiest way to do that is probably to get in touch with us on our hotline. Um, and then you will be kind of routed to the, the correct person and we can try and take care of whatever your needs are. All right, Mado, thank you again to our panelists and all of our guests for joining us today for this important discussion. And uh, with that, I'll kick it back to Brian. All right, thank you, Sterling. And thank you again to our panelists. We appreciate their time and expertise. I'd also like to thank our audience and we'll encourage them to subscribe to the Naja newsletter, visit naja.com and follow us on Facebook and Twitter for announcements about future roundtables in this series. This concludes today's virtual roundtable. We'll see you next time.